Hello, family. I hope you've missed me as much as I've missed you. Marilyn Bostic here with greater news for the week of May 22nd. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. This is the final notice about the Greater Mount Zion Education Cause application for the fall 2022 need-based scholarship to recognize and support outstanding students in our community. Applicants must have a 2.75 GPA on a 4.0 scale. They must graduate from a Central Texas high school and be a member of Greater. In addition, completing an application is necessary. However, you must have an essay, a list of scholastic achievements, extracurricular activities, community service, and leadership opportunities. The applicant must be submitted by Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. You see, the time is winding up, so please complete them. Contact Jessica Andrew at education at gmzaustin.org. Graduations are important milestones. You made it, and it's your time to shine. Behind you, all your memories. Before you, all your dreams. Around you, all who love you. And within you, everything you need. On behalf of the greater family, we want you to know just how proud we are of you. If you're a high school, college, or postgraduate like me, and a member of the class of 2022, we want to honor you. If you plan to be a part of this special celebration, this is on June 12th. We will need you to register no later than Friday, May 27th. For more information, contact Dr. Brandon Jones, student ministry pastor. Women of Greater, let's connect Saturday, May 28th at 10 a.m. at our monthly women's gathering. Meet other women, let's spend some time in the Word, and let's grow together. Stay tuned to the Women's Ministry CCB Group for messages and updates. Contact women at gmzaustin.org. Greater Nation, we've been asking you to update CCB profiles before May 31st. Log in to our online community at www.gmzaustin.org slash ccb. We know the drill. Those five steps we've talked about that we sent emails on, talking about now, and we'll send more emails. And as I say about all of us, we can handle it. If you have any questions, please don't call me. Email Kim Walker at kwalker at gmzaustin.org. Well, it's time for me to go now. So I'll see you next time. And all I can say is stay safe and pray to. Bye for now. Name Jesus, for your name is great and is greatly to be praised. We love you. We adore you. We appreciate you for who you are and what you are in our lives. We thank you. 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 We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Because you're better than good. You're better than good. You're greater than great. You're sweeter than sweet. We bless your name. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together and let's bless him this morning. Come on, Evan. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, he's been better than good to me. Come on, everybody. Listen, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mind. No matter what I see or how I feel, as long as I'm breathing, no, oh yes, I'm breathing, I'll bless the Lord. As long as I'm breathing, no, oh yes, I'm breathing, I'll bless the Lord. Come on, everybody, put your hands together, everybody, come on, and sing with us. 
I will bless. I will bless the Lord at all times. Hey, and His praises shall continually be in my mind. No matter what I see, no what I see or how I feel, as long as I'm breathing, yes, I'm breathing. If you're here this morning, you have a reason to bless Him. Come on. Everybody, oh man. We come to bless his name. Come on, let's lay down. And lift up his name. Let's do it together. Let's do it together. Come on, we're going to sing the verse one more time. Everybody, all over the building. Come on, lift your voice, everybody. I will bless you. Yeah. 
Hello, family. I hope you've missed me as much as I've missed you. Marilyn Bostic here with greater news for the week of May 22nd. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. This is the final notice about the Greater Mount Zion Education Cause application for the Fall 2022 Need-Based Scholarship to recognize and support outstanding students in our community. Applicants must have a 2.75 GPA on a 4.0 scale. They must graduate from a Central Texas high school and be a member of Greater. In addition, completing an application is necessary. However, you must have an essay, a list of scholastic achievements, extracurricular activities, community service, and leadership opportunities. The applicant must be submitted by Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. You see, the time is winding up, so please complete them. Contact Jessica Andrew at education at gmzaustin.org. Graduations are important milestones. You made it, and it's your time to shine. Behind you, all your memories. Before you, all your dreams. Around you, all who love you, and within you, everything you need. On behalf of the greater family, we want you to know just how proud we are of you. If you're a high school, college, or postgraduate like me, and a member of the class of 2022, we want to honor you. If you plan to be a part of this special celebration, this is on June 12th. We will need you to register no later than Friday, May 27th. For more information, contact Dr. Brandon Jones, student ministry pastor. Women of Greater, let's connect Saturday, May 28th at 10 a.m. at our monthly women's gathering. Meet other women, let's spend some time in the Word, and let's grow together. Stay tuned to the Women's Ministry CCB group for messages and updates. Contact women at gmzaustin.org. Greater Nation, we've been asking you to update CCB profiles before May 31st. Log in to our online community at www.gmzaustin.org slash ccb. We know the drill. Those five steps we've talked about that we sent emails on, talking about now, and we'll send more emails. And as I say about all of us, we can handle it. If you have any questions, please don't call me. Email Kim Walker at kwalker at gmzaustin.org. Well, it's time for me to go now. So I'll see you next time. And all I can say is stay safe and pray to up. Bye for now. Well, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of our Wednesday Night Live Bible Study that is being powered through the ministry of Greater Mount Zion. 
I am Pastor Vicente Cotney, and I'm glad that you are taking time to study God's Word with us. As you are coming on, I want you to do a couple of things for us as we are engaging this time at the beginning of our study tonight together. Why don't you share this stream? Why don't you like this post? And if you're watching us on YouTube, why don't you subscribe? to our YouTube channel if you have not done so. We invite you to do this each week because we believe that there is a word from God that is emanating from our campus that's gonna meet you right where you are. And um, hopefully it will not only be a benefit to you, but it would serve as a source of encouragement. And dare I say, maybe even a level of a uh, empowerment uh, to somebody in your sphere of influence. And so why don't you use this time to do that? And as you are coming on, why don't you let me know how you're feeling today? Uh, I, we, I want us to engage each other in the chat. Why don't you share how you're feeling today? If you had a great day, why don't you share maybe a win that the Lord allowed you to experience today? If you are like me and uh, you are Mm. You're not quite sure how to feel today because of what's been going on in our world over the last 10 days, and in particular what's taken place over the last day or so. Uh, why don't you share that as well? I believe God is in uh, all of this, and while <laughs> I can't quite see his hand in all of this, I know that it is there. And uh, so I want this to be a safe space where you can share, and maybe uh, as you are seeing uh, people respond to this question. Why don't we encourage those of, uh, why don't we encourage each other for those of us who are kind of in a weird space and why don't we celebrate what God is doing in the lives of those who are experiencing wins? Why don't you share how you're feeling today uh, as we uh, begin our time together and hopefully in, um, as a result of our time together, we will all walk away from this place, of course, with a bigger vision of God and a greater appreciation for what he is doing in our lives. And so why don't you, and, uh, why don't you do that? So share the post, like the post, and uh, share how you're feeling today, uh, regardless to how you're feeling, uh, so that we can encourage each other uh, as we have been called to do as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, we have made it to the end of this series of lessons that we have labeled over the last few weeks under construction. And over the last few weeks, we have discussed various character qualities that we believe that the Lord is desiring uh, to design and develop in our lives um, so that we can experience the best that God has to offer in our lives. Christian experience. And so we've talked about a, a host of character qualities. Um, like uh, we talked about, uh, we began our time talking about cultivating courage. And we talked about the value and the significance of living a life of discipline. We've looked at the value of having a God sized, God led vision for your life. And uh, we last week looked at uh, how we are called as believers to be faithful to the finish. We looked at endurance and the significance that it plays in our lives and in the growth and development of our spiritual lives. And the reason why, in my estimation, God is interested in constructing our character and developing these character qualities in our life is simply because God has made you and I people of influence. Do me a favor, why don't you type in the chat or why don't you declare wherever you are, I'm an influencer. I'm an influencer. I am an influencer. Say it until you believe it. I am an influencer. Type it until you believe it. I am an influencer. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from. You, ma'am, you, sir, are a person of, of influence. Now, for some of us, that might pose a challenge 
Because when you hear the term influencer, you think about how we have labeled, uh, or you think about rather the type of person that we have labeled influencer in our culture. Don't know if you realize this or not, but ours is a culture now that tends to slap the label of influencer on only those people in our culture, watch this, that have that blue check mark, that verified check mark on their social media pages. We, we are part of a culture that labels influencers, um, people like celebrities or rock stars or rap artists or um, uh, pastors, business gurus, some politicians. The reality is, in our culture, all you need to uh, be, all, all that you need in order to be an influencer is to have some level of money, power, prestige, or position. And if you have any one of those, you, ma'am, are considered an influencer, which then eliminates in our mind, right, the majority of us, because most of us ain't got a lot of money, we ain't got a lot of power, we ain't got a lot of prestige, we don't have no major position in the world, and so we erroneously assume that our influence is, our influence rather, is of little to no consequence. But God sent me here this week to remind you that that's the furthest thing from the truth. Hear me tonight. You, ma'am, you, sir, not only have the capacity to be an influencer, but you currently are a person of influence. You are a person of influence. You are a person of influence. You are impacting people in noticeable ways right from where you are. Are sure you don't have thousands of uh, people who like your posts or hundreds of thousands of followers on your social media, but if you are breathing and if you are interacting with anybody in your world in any way, whether you know it or not, you, ma'am, you, sir, are an influencer. Come on, declare it one more time. Say, I'm an influencer. I'm an I'm an influencer. Your, your, your attitude influences others. Your behaviors influence others. Your choices influence others. What you say, what you don't say, makes an appreciable difference in the life of people every day. And this is why the Lord is so intentional on trying to cultivate and construct the type of character that is needed uh, the, or rather the type of character rather that he is attempting to construct in your life because what you do what you say has a life shaping influence on somebody else and this is even more true this would this would be even more true uh, uh, this would this would be true rather if you were just a regular person but this is even more true for those of us who are believers. Friend, by virtue of the fact that you are a Christ follower, you are a person of influence. And what God is trying to do as he constructs our character is position us so that we could ignite and increase the influence that he has given us. And so tonight, I want to talk about how we can ignite our influence, igniting our influence. I want you to listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and, and 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So when we talk about igniting our influence, God says very simply, 
this. You and I ought to ignite our influence to let our light shine very simply because darkness is everywhere. You see, God is trying to construct our character in such a way, or the way, the, or the reason rather, that and the reason why God is constructing our character in the way in which he is, is because he is aware that darkness is everywhere. And listen, I don't have to tell you this. You can see it. Darkness is covering our world. All you got to do is swipe through your, your timeline, turn on the news, and every day you and I are seeing the, the ways in which darkness is intending to encroach on our way of life. Just about every area of our world is dark now. We're being covered by racial darkness. I just want to talk to us tonight. We've been covered by racial darkness. The, the race situation has always been a problem for people of color and in particular African Americans, but it's getting completely out of hand, y'all. Seems like there's literally nothing we can do to navigate this world. We can't drive while black, we can't buy groceries while black, we can't care Skittles while black, listen to music while black, go to church while black, we can't jog in our neighborhoods while black, we can't eat ice cream sitting on our couch while black, we can't go on interviews while black, we can't play in the park while black, we can't even sleep in our beds while black. Friend, we're being covered by a racial darkness. Our hearts, the hearts of some rather, are so hardened toward people of color, not just African Americans, um, uh, but, but also, uh, I don't know if you realized over the last uh, 10 days that there were some Asian people in church. They, they couldn't even worship in the Taiwanese Presbyterian church. Friend, our world is so broken. Our, our world is so dark, we no longer see the imago Dei, the image of God stamped on people who look different from us. And we cover by racial darkness. We're being covered by political darkness. I ain't telling you nothing you don't already know. I'm just saying it because I think it's perfect for what we're talking about tonight. We're covered by political darkness. We've got a group of people on one side of the aisle, male politicians who think it's perfectly fine to legislate the liberties of a woman's reproductive choice. We claim to be a, a pro-life country, but only through the womb. Because once the baby is born, there's nothing in place, not just, for parent, not just for baby, but for parent, to live a meaningful life. Not, not, not to mention, we're being represented by some leaders who would rather pussyfoot around gun laws than protect innocent children, friends. We're covered by political darkness. We're covered by economic darkness. Darkness is, is everywhere. It's encroaching on every area of our lives, including the economy. We can't afford for many of us to live in the cities that we are attempting to occupy. And if the truth be told, most of you who are watching me tonight, as you are watching me, we are all just about two missed paychecks away from poverty. There are people in this world, friends, who have to choose between going to work and having food to eat. Man, we can't even find formula to feed the most vulnerable in our country, and this claims to be the best country in the world. And our babies can't even get the food that they need. The most vulnerable in our world can't find baby formula. And if they can find it, they can't afford it. Most, many people rather. 
It's hard out here. Because there is economic darkness. There's political darkness. There's racial darkness. And there's some of you, you're experiencing your own personal darkness. You know what you're feeling. You know what you're experiencing. And you wonder, where is God in all of this? And Lord, when are you going to turn the lights on? Friend, with all that's going on around us, we can be tempted to shake our fist at God and cry out, God, where are you in all of this darkness? We need you to turn the light on. And God is saying to you and I, I know it's real dark. Part of the reason why I'm letting it get dark and part of the reason why you are experiencing so much darkness is because for some of us, we have yet to acknowledge the fact that we are the light. Friends, we're, we're walking around crying about the lack of light that we see in the world, the prevailing darkness that is encroaching every area of our lives and is clearly everywhere. And we're asking God, God, where is the light? And God is saying, you are the light. Friends, can I tell you, you are the solution. I am the solution to many of the ills that are taking shape in the world. And here's the good news tonight. We don't just have light, we are light. And we are supposed to shine, friend. God says, I've been trying to shape you in such a way and put you in certain positions and develop certain things in you because I have, I've given you what you need to shine bright. That's why the saints of old would declare at the church that I grew up in, the deacons would sing it just about every Sunday, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. In my neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. All in my home, all in my school, all at my church, I'm going I'm to I'm let it shine. Because they understood that we don't just have light According to this text, we are light and we are supposed to shine because while darkness is encroaching every area of our life and while darkness is seemingly everywhere, when we choose to shine, hear me tonight, darkness can be eliminated. Darkness is meant to be eliminated and so Jesus says to us, let your light shine, ignite your influence. Let me cultivate in you what I'm trying to cultivate in you and construct in you what I'm trying to construct in you because cause, cause when you let your light shine, darkness is eliminated. You see, light is an amazing thing. Light is one of those things that doesn't have physical properties, but it does have a profound effect on physical objects. You see, light is very, excuse me, is very simply a wave of energy that you and I can see with the naked eye. And light, friend, is so powerful that wherever light is revealed, darkness is repelled. Somebody type that in the chat for me. Wherever light is revealed, darkness is is repelled. And here's what I've come to discover about light. It doesn't even have to be a lot of light. Friend, even if there is just a flicker of light, if there's a flicker of light, darkness goes, goes to flee. I don't know if many of you experienced this on last night, um, but on last night we had a, a quick storm to come through around 11.30 and um, I was still up. My wife was still up. Y'all know we got this 12-week-old uh, baby. And, um, and uh, so we were up. And uh, while we were up, the lights went out. And it was completely dark in our house. We were trying to navigate getting him in the bed for his 
you know, for his nighttime, you know, for as long as he would sleep throughout the night. And my wife, quite naturally, we didn't have access to all of the light that we normally would, but, but she lit one candle. And that one candle lit up our entire room. She took another candle and took it into the vast darkness of our living room, set it on our counter, our bar in the living room, and it lit up the whole living room. Because wherever light is revealed, darkness is repelled. And so here's the question that I have for you for the balance of our time together. As we close this time of being under construction, here's the relevant question. How are we supposed to shine? Well, J Jesus tells us in verse 16 how we ought to do it. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Now, of course, this isn't the answer that many of us would expect Jesus to give to us, right? Typically, for those of us who've been walking with Christ for a while, or if you're new to the faith, you might assume that Jesus would say, let your light shine before others so that they may see how holy you are. Or let your light shine so that men may see the power of the gospel. No, he says power of the spoken gospel. But he says, no, no, no. He says, let your light shine so that when people see you, they will see good works. Now, of course, when we talk about good works, we, we understand that the Bible teaches us that good works are not uh, what saves us. And so we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. And what Jesus is simply trying to tell us here is this. There comes a point in all of our lives where we have to have, um, uh, where we have to answer the question, what good am I doing? That's what Jesus is trying to get us to understand here. It's this nuanced idea that encompasses far more than doing charitable deeds alone. It's, it's, it's giving us the opportunity to ask ourselves, what good can I do? In other words, Jesus is saying to you and I tonight that he wants us to determine how we can leverage our influence to impact the lives of others. I think there are a few ways. I'll lift them and then we'll, 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 we'll be done for tonight. Friends, as the light of the world, we have been called to spread love. We have been called to spread love. God says, listen, I need you to leverage your influence to love others. I'm not telling you nothing that you don't already know, but I need you to hear it against the backdrop of what we are experiencing in our culture. I need you to ask yourself at a whole nother level, what can I do to spread love? First Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, listen, I, I want to show you a more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not love, I am I'm nothing. If I give all of my possessions to the poor and give my body over to hardship that I may boast, but if I don't have love, I gain nothing. This is the kind of love that you and I are called as influences to operate in. He says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not, does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Did you hear me? Love always protects. Washington, D.C., did you hear me? Love always protects. It 
always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease, and where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Paul says, for when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see. Face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. This is really where I wanted to get. And now these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Friends, what is the next? dimension of love that you are being called to live in. Because here's what I know about love. Love is something that the blind can see and the dumb can understand. It crosses all kinds of barriers. And as believers, friends, this is the most meaningful thing that we can do with our influence is make it our business to intentionally love people without exception and without any extra expectation. Did you hear what I said? God is calling you and I to love others without exception and without any extra expectation. This is what we've been called to. Jesus says, a new command I give you, John 13, 34, and 35. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, again, I ain't telling you nothing you don't already know, but I want you to wrestle with it a little bit this week. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Not by how well you shout. Not by how much money you put in the offering. He says, the world will know that you are my disciples, not just because you post scriptures on your Facebook page. He says, the world will know that you belong to me because of the love that you have for one another. Friend, I start here because everything that I'm going to say after this are just merely expressions of love. And so the most meaningful thing that you and I can do with our influence, if we're going to let our light shine, is spread love. Without exception and without any extra expectation. To just go around and leverage whatever influence we have to give love away. Because that's what we've been called to do, friends. And I know at times it's difficult particularly when you're talking about showing love to somebody, watch this, when you feel like you're not getting the love in return. That's why I said, show love without any extra expectation. Because we give love because we have been given love by God. So as influencers, we spread love, but here's the next one. As influencers, as people who are considered the light of the world, we're called to selflessly seek to meet the needs of others. This is, again, an extension of what I was just talking about. I want you to look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but looking to the interests of others. We are called to selflessly seek to meet the needs of others. And this ain't something that's new to us as believers. In fact, this was one of the distinguishing factors of Christians after Jesus went back to heaven. The Bible tells us that, that the early church in Acts chapter 2 
had everything in common. Acts chapter 2, verse 44 through 46 says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They, listen to what they did. They sold their property and their possessions to give to anyone who had a need. And every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Friends, God is calling you and I to be the light of the world and to leverage our influence, to ignite at a whole nother level our influence, to selflessly seek to meet the needs of others, to leverage our influence, to make life better for somebody else. Can you imagine, friend, what kind of world this would be if everybody stopped looking out for their own interests and started looking more toward the interests of others? And I get it. Because we, we fear that if we spend more time pouring out, that we won't get what we need poured back into us. But that's the beauty, right, of having a world that is increasingly looking out for the interests of others. Because as you see I have a need, you are willing to give to me. And as I see that you have a need, you, I am willing, rather, to um, give to you. You imagine what kind of world this would be. If we didn't focus so much on what we needed and focused on the needs of others. I thought about this, um, uh, and I, I, I actually often think about this anytime a major storm comes to Texas. You know, here in Texas, we, we don't, we're not used to, uh, uh, we used to hurricanes, we used to floods. Uh, we, we don't really do ice and snow uh, in Texas, not in the part of Texas where I am currently recording this and having this conversation with you. Here in Austin, we don't really do ice that much. And so if we hear that an ice storm is going to come, nine times out of ten, we go into the store and we bind up all the toilet paper. And we bind up all the paper towels. We bind up all the non-perishable food items. Because we got to make sure we have what we need because we don't know how long we going to be locked in. And we fail to realize that there are almost a million people in Austin, Travis and Williamson County, Hayes County, who need the same thing you do. What if we went into the stores and got what we needed and left some stuff <laughs> on the shelf so that somebody else could get it, so some grandmother could get it. So some single mother who has more than one child can get what it is that they need. Friend, as believers, that's what we've been called to do, to not live a selfish life, but to selflessly give ourselves over to ensuring that other people have what they need. Friends, how are you doing with that? Maybe it's not a physical need, but, 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 but imagine what the world would be like if you were in such an emotional space where you were able to give of your emotion. And as you are pouring out and making sure that somebody has the emotional, uh, requisite emotional strength that they need, somebody else is pouring back into you. Can, can you see how beautiful of a world this could, could be? Friends, we're called to actually ignite that kind of thing in the world. Sometimes the most meaningful thing you and I can do is look around us and pay attention to those around you and make ourselves available to serve and support those who are in need. To go out of our way, to engage in a simple act of kindness and, and compassion because we let our light shine when we choose to selflessly seek out meeting the needs of others. Here's the next one. Friends, we, we have been called as the light of the world, as people of influence, to not only selflessly seek out the needs of others, not only spread love, but you see something building. We all, we've also been called to stand for justice. As influencers, God is shaping the kind of character in us so that we can have the ability 
to leverage our influence to eliminate the darkness of every kind of ism and schism that is prevalent in the world. Whether that's racism or classism, ageism, sexism, whatever level of ism or schism that's taking shape in the world, you and I as believers are called to have the kind of character that's willing to leverage our influence to eliminate that darkness. Now, I say this because I really do believe that the church was designed to stand on the forefront of conversations regarding justice. Friend, we are called, hear me, as the people of God to speak out against, to posture ourselves in such a way where we speak out against oppression and we defend those who are on the margins of life to live as peacemakers and to lead our communities in reconciliation and transformative change. If you remember, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s started in the church. But something has taken shape in our churches where we have moved away I wish I had somebody who would help me right up and through here. We've gotten so caught up in our own personal um, uh, uh, um, uh, game and our own personal pursuit of what we deem the American dream and we've forgotten about those who are out on the margins of life. But hear me, there's no group more prepared, more qualified, more equipped to deal with the complex and divisive issues in our world than people of God who are filled with the Spirit of God and who are guided by the Word of God. This is what we have been called to do. To let our light shine by standing up for justice. Our hearts should break, friends, for the injustice that we see in the world. And I know that most of the people that I'm talking to are people who are of African and African-American descent. But just in case this may reach somebody who is of a different hue than the majority of the people who are watching this tonight, can I say to you that you, ma'am, you, sir, have a responsibility now. You, we have said everything that there is to be said. We have done everything that we think that we know to do. We have prayed and we've appreciated your thoughts and prayers. But now at this point, because of what you now see in the world, your thoughts and prayers without the requisite action just seems incredibly disrespectful and dismissive at best. And there's another level of action that we've been called to. And if you see me as a brother in Christ, as I see you as a brother and a sister in Christ, then you have a responsibility to leverage your influence, my friend. To speak out against injustice. This is what Jesus did. Jesus says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim, here it is, good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoner and recovery of sight to the blind. Listen to what he says. To set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Friend, God is always standing on the side of the oppressed. And it really doesn't matter how much we serve in church if the influence and impact of what we are doing in our buildings isn't being felt in the community in which our churches are occupying. Pastor Clark, I'll never forget it. As we were preparing to move over here, he launched the eight great causes. Many of you who are part of Greater Mount Zion, you know that the eight great causes are central uh, to the ministry of Greater Mount Zion. And I'll never forget, he gathered the leaders together our lead pastor, Galen Clark, we were at Pennsylvania at the time, and I remember sitting on the front row looking at him, and he asked this question. He said, if Greater Mount Zion were to leave from this corner of Selena and Pennsylvania, would anybody in East Austin miss us? Or would the only people who miss us be the people who are coming in from Round Rock 
I'm from Pflugerville and from Huddo and from Lake Travis. From East, East, East Austin, from Maina and Elgin. It's beautiful that we get people who are willing to come 15, 20, 30, some of us 40 minutes away to come to our place of worship. But would the people in the community miss us? Or would our presence be of little to no impact? Now, of course, those of you who are part of Greater Mount Zion, you know full well the kind of church that we are. We are a church that is in the city for the city. We are a church that's in the community for the community. It's one of the things that I absolutely love about our church. And we are willing to speak to injustice and to serve those who are out on the margins of life. This is what we've been called to do. God says in, in, through the prophet Micah in Micah chapter 6, verse number 8, he says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your I'm going to push toward the close, but I, I'll say this. Friends, if you and I are going to attempt to do our part in standing for justice, I think it's important that we engage in what a gentleman by the name of Scott uh, Rito labels biblical ways to take action against, excuse me, injustice and racism. He says the first thing that you and I have to do is engage the ministry of prayer. Somebody type prayer in the chat. The ministry of prayer. Because prayer begins, or, or, or let me say it, prayer is the source of change in every situation. G God says to the children of Israel in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, you've heard these words before, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive sin and heal land. He says, not only do you need the ministry of prayer, but you need the ministry of presence. Somebody type the ministry of presence. Because sometimes, and this is what I've come to discover as I uh, have had the opportunity to walk people through some of the most difficult and challenging areas and seasons of their lives. Sometimes, friends, the most powerful thing that we can do in a given moment is just be there. Now, prayer and the ministry of presence is where it begins. We've got to do more than engage prayer and the ministry of presence. But this is where it starts. He says we also have to engage a plan of personal growth, that we've got to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to let our face, to make sure that our face is in the word of God so that we can get the wisdom and the marching orders of what to do next in the midst of what appears to be such dark times. Friends, if you and I are not careful, we can allow the darkness around us to overwhelm us in such a way to where we end up doing nothing. But the, one of the greatest things you and I can do is engage a level of personal growth. And so there's prayer. There's the ministry of presence. There's personal growth. But then there's the participation in good. Somebody type participate in what's good. Participate in what's good. Friend, always remember this. You and I are called to not just be good people. But we are called as believers to do good deeds. Remember, the text says, let your light shine before men so that they can see your good works, your good deeds. And so we ought to make sure that we are doing good for the whole of the community, not just part of the community or the part of the community that we are comfortable with. We've got to reach beyond our comfort zones and begin to reach across aisles and reach across people, reach across to people who are not like 
us and make it our business to intentionally do good to them, do just as good to them as we would do good to those in our own community. To want good for them, just like we would want good for those in our own community. And this is the reason why, because Rito says, partnership is the pathway to relationship. And relationship is the pathway to trust. And when trust is established, trust will open the door to depths of vulnerability, understanding, compassion, and commitment necessary to begin steps toward lasting change. And so you need prayer. You need the ministry of presence. If you're going to do justice and walk humbly and love mercy, you're going to need to engage in some level of personal growth and participate in doing good. But he says, finally, you want to engage in using your voice and using your vote and using all of your strength and vigor and vitality to call for policy change. Because unfortunately, in this culture, if it is not on the books, it ain't real. At least that's how some people approach engaging certain people. And so as citizens, friends, we have rights for sure. But as Christians, we have more than rights. We have a responsibility to intervene on behalf of others, to use our voice and our vote to make sure that the marginalized gets relief, the relief that they need, and that those who the culture tries to minimize experiences justice. And so you need prayer. I'm going to give it to you again. If you're going to do this, do this justice thing, you're going to stand for justice. You need prayer. You need presence. You need an intentional plan of growth. You need to make it your business to participate in doing good, not just for the people who are a part of your community, but for the community as a whole. And you need to use your voice and your vote to do what is necessary to begin the process of enacting policy change. Friends, it is, we have a responsibility to not just vote every four years. I try to make it my business personally to vote in every election possible because I realize that my vote is my voice. And for, for people of color, I'm going to just say it. I may get in trouble for saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't think it's an accident that here in Texas there are things in place to try to suppress the vote of people who look like the majority of you who are watching tonight. It's because they know that when we use our voice, when we use our vote rather, it is our voice and we can enact the necessary change to bring about the change that God is looking for in these last and evil days. So we've been called friends. I don't even know how I got here. I'm just, y'all forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm just having a conversation tonight. I'm laying my burden down. So, so forgive me. Come back next week. We'll have a more intentional, in-depth Bible study regarding the scriptures. But I had a burden on my heart, and it just so happened to be connected to the lesson that we were, were teaching tonight. As a person of influence, as the light of the world, we spread love. We selflessly seek to meet the needs of others. We stand for justice because we understand that justice is important to God and it ought to be important to us. Friend, here's the deal. I'm done, but while it's true that darkness is everywhere, when you and I let our light shine, when we ignite our influence, it has the power to eliminate darkness. Hear me tonight. You and I have been called and commissioned to make a difference in the world. And even if you don't feel like you have the influence to make a huge, sizable difference in the world, 
I guarantee you that if you use whatever influence you have, you ignite that influence, you let your light shine, you let God cultivate in you the kind of character that he's trying to develop in you and construct in you, you will make a difference in the life or in the world of somebody, somebody else's world. And so tonight, be the light. Make it a point to realize that you not only have light, but that you are light. Because wherever light is revealed, darkness is repelled. I'm, I'm, I'm done, but the story is told of a man uh, who would go to the ocean quite often to write. He was an author and he would write. He'd go to the ocean, sit out on the ocean, walk along the beach, and as he would get inspired, to get inspiration for what it is he was writing. So he would walk on the beach very, every morning before he began writing. And one, one morning he went out there and uh, he, 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 he noticed that the shore was a mess. A big storm had come the previous night and uh, the beach where he was walking was littered with starfish as far as the eye could see going in both directions. And off in the distance, he saw a little boy walking toward him. But, but he noticed that as he was walking toward him, the little boy is, that the little boy would stop every three to four steps, stoop down, get back up. He noticed it. And as he was getting closer to the boy, he noticed what the boy was doing. He was stopping to pick up starfish, scooping them up off the beach, throwing them back into the sea. So they meet. And, and the little boy, or the man says rather to the little boy, what you doing out here? To which the little boy said, I'm, I'm out here saving starfish. Because of the storm last night, they are all on the beach. And if they stay on the beach, they will dry out and die. So I'm putting them back in the ocean so that they can have a chance to live. And the old man was silent for a couple of seconds and then he said, young man, I, I've been doing this walk every day for about 10 years and here's what I know. On this stretch of beach alone, you have at least tens of thousands of starfish on this beach. If you were to keep walking around the corner, there's another 100,000 more. Surely you don't think you have what it takes to make a difference. To which the boy, not saying anything to the man, bent down, picked up yet another starfish, threw it as far as he could in the ocean, and then looked at the man and smiled and said, well, looks like I just made a difference for that one. Picked up another one, threw it as far as he could and said, well, at least I made a difference for that one. Friend, you may not be able to make as big of a difference. You may not feel, rather, that you have as much influence as you think you do. But hear me when I tell you tonight. The reason why God desires to construct your character, to place you under construction, is because he's made you a person of influence. And I want to urge you to take another step of faith to use your influence where you live, work, and play to make life better for those around you by spreading love, by seeking to meet the needs of others, by standing for justice. And so, Father, that's our prayer tonight. You would give us the courage to do so, the strength to do so in such a dark world. We need you to do this. We need your help to do this. And we trust that you're going to give us what we need and continue to construct in our hearts the discipline, the courage, the endurance, and the vision to make it possible so that when people see our good works, they'll glorify you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you. Y'all have a great night.